Turn in your King James Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. I'm going to prove to you in this study, um, if you have any kind of spiritual understanding at all, I'm going to prove it to you. If you believe that this is God's book, I'm going to show you, primarily from the Old Testament, that uh, Jesus Christ appeared in the Torah, the first five books of Moses. I'm going to show it to you. Um, Genesis chapter 32. And I will be showing you things today that no rabbi out there, uh, especially the Talmudic ones, they won't show you this stuff. But I'm going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And it will line up. And I will prove it to you. Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 24. The Bible says here, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For, go, as, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Watch the last study, you know what the name is. Um, and he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, uh, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. All right, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Okay, now there's only a couple of options there. Option number one, um, the translation is an error, which is nonsense. The translation of the King James Bible is the greatest translation in the history of man. 54 of... England's best scholars at the time spending seven years, um, all the best manuscript evidence, everything else that they had there, uh, been tried and tested like no other Bible in history. Um, there's nothing wrong with the translation. Okay, so we can get rid of number one. Okay, option number one, the translation's an error. No. Um, it is supposed to be right there. I've seen God face to face. Okay, option number two, Jacob was just speaking symbolically, sort of, you know, I've seen this angel of the Lord that did sort of this thing and he reminds me of God. No, it's not symbolic. Okay. He actually said that he saw God face to face. That leaves only one possibility. <clears throat> and that is that he did in fact wrestle with a physical manifestation of God. All right. Now, who was it? Is it God the Father that wrestled with him? Go to Hosea. To the minor prophets. <clears throat> this event happened in the Torah, so I said I would prove uh, Jesus Christ in the Torah, and I will be, but Hosea describes this event that happened and says something very interesting. So go back to the book of Hosea towards, go towards the New Testament, and you'll find the book of Hosea. These uh, minor prophets, a lot of people struggle with these including myself, ever since I was a boy, I always had a hard time finding the different uh, books. You know, where's this book? Where's that book? Whatever else. Um, it uh, comes right before Joel. Okay, but look at uh, Hosea chapter 12. All right? And it refers back to this thing of Jacob wrestling God, the angel of the Lord there. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 12, verse 2. The Lord also hath also a controversy with Judah, and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel. It's referring back to Genesis chapter 32. And prevailed, he wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Hmm. <clears throat> Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. 
he set up a memorial there to, you know, Peniel or whatever. And he said, I've seen God face to face. The Lord is his memorial. But notice it says there um, in verse 4, and there he spake with us. Yeah, because you see, God consists of three parts. The body, the angel of the Lord there, is Jesus Christ. God the Father is the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. So you go back to the story, there's only one being there present, the angel of the Lord. But yet, in Hosea, it says that he spake with us. Hmm. Very interesting. It proves the Godhead. You say, well, it's proof of the Trinity. No, because the Trinity teaches that there's three separate persons. There weren't three separate persons. There were a tag team, you know, and Jacob's wrestling, the, you know, Jesus, the, the angel of the Lord a little bit, and he reaches over and he tags God the Father's hand, and God the Father comes in and starts beating on Jacob, and about that time, the Holy Spirit, he jumps over the ropes, and uh, no, it didn't work that way. There's one person. But yet it's said to be us, three in one. Pretty amazing. Judges chapter 13. Let's go back there. You say, well, okay, but you know, is Jacob, he got a little confused. It, he just meant, he didn't actually mean that he had seen God. Um, he saw this angel of the Lord. But, you know, he was wrong to say it was God. He was just confused. And he's the only one that that ever happened to, right? Wrong. Judges chapter 13. Now, I know this isn't in the Torah, but this is giving, we saw Genesis chapter 13, 32. The Torah there, Jacob wrestling with God, is referred back to in the book of Hosea. Now we're going to see somebody else who sees God in the form of the angel of the Lord. To give you reference there that it happened more than once. Uh, Judges chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste, and ran, and showed her husband, and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me, that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose, and went after his wife, and came to the man, and sat, and said unto him, Art thou the man that speakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee, until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Remember that term, angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou the, uh, thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Huh. It's an interesting thing there. Jacob asked the same thing. What's your name? Why are you asking me my name? Same thing going on here. Don't ask me my name. It's a secret thing. See, the name isn't revealed yet, the name above every name, because he didn't come and physically manifest himself as the Savior of the world, which he did in the New Testament. Verse 19, So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven, from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. Our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. Hmm. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife than Manoah, Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen an angel of God. No, it says we have seen God. Hmm, we have seen God. Interesting. 
How about that? So it wasn't just Jacob that saw the angel of the Lord, the angel of God there. It was Manoah as well. Two men saw Jesus Christ showing up, the physical manifestation of God. Later he's called Jesus. But back then it was just, I'm just call me an angel of God. You don't need to know my name. Galatians 4, 4, 14. Go to the New Testament now. Hopefully you can. Hopefully you're open-minded enough to have a New Testament. If you're Jewish out there and you're reading. Unless you're in some kind of cult that doesn't allow you to read uh, books from your enemies. Galatians 4.14. I have a whole bunch of books up here. The History of the Jews. I have the Holy Scriptures, Hebrew and you know, English. The, um, all the different things in here and whatever else. Complete Jewish Bible. I have... Um, a whole bunch of stuff up here. Some Muslims sent me that stuff. And I don't know if I have a copy of the Talmud. I think I do someplace, but <laughs> I'm not afraid. Uh, the Pentateuch and half Torah is over there. And, and um, yeah, I have so many books. I lose track after a while of all that I have. But uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 14. My point being, I'm not afraid of anything in terms of reading things. Um, and you shouldn't be either if you're open-minded. Uh, Galatians 4:14. 4, Paul writing here, he says, "And my temptations, uh, and my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Even as that's a, he's it's defining the term that comes beforehand, angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Hmm." Who's the angel of God in the Old Testament? Jesus Christ. That's who it is. They call it a theophany. You know, God manifesting in the flesh before the New Testament time comes. Interesting. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses one through six. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I'm trying to do that right now, I'm trying to commend myself to your conscience. You can see these things and say. Yeah, Jacob saw God and Manoah saw God. and It's the angel of God in the New Testament. The angel of God is identified as Christ Jesus. Huh. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Hmm. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the glory of God comes through the face of Jesus Christ. How does that work? You see, it's very confusing to me. Um, well, when you put all the scriptures together, it's not. You see the whole picture. If I take a jigsaw puzzle and I open it up and I just take all the contents of the box and throw them out onto the floor, and here's a piece there and there's a piece there, it's confusing. But when you start to put all the pieces together, they come together and this one clicks with that one and that's an edge piece and this is a corner piece and you, you get the, the border together and then you start to work your way into the jigsaw puzzle and pretty soon it's a beautiful picture. Well, that's the Godhead doctrine. All right, You'd say, I don't understand. What about this and what about that? But when you start to connect things, you start to put things together. God was manifest in the flesh. Hmm. He came down in an incorruptible form as the angel of God in the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, a body hast thou prepared me. He comes down in the form of and likeness of men. He comes down like that. And he lives and he dies on the cross. He feels the pain. He lives without sinning as the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And then... Afterward, he goes up to heaven and comes back down, and he has an incorruptible body. 
Okay, you can see it. You can start to see how this whole thing works out. But you say, but okay, there's the body of God, but the Bible says no man hath seen God at any time in another place. That's right. It's talking about the Father in that context. You say, wait, but Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Father in the sense of that they're one being, but there's a difference between the body and the soul. That's what you're seeing right here. The glory of God, the soul, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the people back there in the first century, they, uh, they saw him, but they didn't know that he was God. They're looking at this guy and they're looking into his face and looking into his eyes and they're saying, hey, he just looks like a regular guy, I guess. He looks like a regular man. You're looking at God manifest in the flesh. You know, Jacob and Manoah, um, did either one of those guys know that they're wrestling God? No, they look and they say, you know, who are you? What's your name? I don't understand who you are. They didn't understand it was God until the Lord goes back up to heaven and they go, I have seen God face to face. Glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There, Jacob talked with us, Hosea. Pretty deep stuff. Genesis chapter 14, I'll show you another one. If you don't have a clear enough one there, I'll show you an even better one. Genesis chapter 14. Let's go back to the Torah. First five books of Moses. Genesis 14. You know, I've noticed a lot of these rabbis too. Um, I've, I've been watching lots of rabbi videos lately, just seeing different things that they believe about the Hashem thing and the, the Noahide laws and whatever else. And they just sit there and blah, 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 blah. How about pick up your Bible and turn in your Bible? Let me show you what the scriptures say. I'm encouraging you to read your Bible, to look at this stuff for yourself. Compare scripture with scripture. Make sure I'm teaching you the truth. They don't do that. You're just supposed to take their word for it. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Well, who's this? There's all sorts of debate and, oh, we're not really sure. It could have been Shem, um, you know, that got off the ark and whatever else. He's still alive and he's the priest of the Most High God. I think it was Shem. And well, no, it could have been, you know, this guy or that guy. And there's all this debate. But if you actually compare Scripture with Scripture, there is no debate. It tells you very plainly. Go to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. You know, the two magicians that are there with Pharaoh when Moses is bringing the children of Israel out, the book of Exodus, it just says that there's two magicians. You don't know their names until you get to the New Testament, and it's listed as Janus and Jambres. Hmm. Well, here you have another example of who is this mysterious Melchizedek figure. I wonder who it is. Well, your King James Bible tells you who it is in the New Testament. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And, okay, you have Melchizedek spelled a little bit different in the Old Testament because you're coming from Hebrew to English. Here you're coming from Greek to English. That's why there's a difference in the spelling, but it's the same name. All right. Hmm. Who is Melchizedek? Uh, Jesus. You say, no, it's just he's a, he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is there, and then Jesus is a priest after that order. That's not what it's saying. Jesus is Melchizedek. Let me show you further proof. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. <clears throat> Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So you see the thing of again of that. But look at chapter 7. Um, Verse 1 through 3. For this 
Melchizedek. Now we're talking about Melchizedek. King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. That's what we just read about back there in Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, uh, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now here's where the Trinitarians just smash their heads into the pavement and just don't come up for a while and they just lay there and it can't be Jesus. It can't be Jesus because it says without father and having neither, you know, uh, nor end of life. It can't be Jesus. It can't be Jesus. Um, it's talking about God there. Okay, Jesus is God. So without father, is there a part of God that is without father? Uh-huh. Yeah, that would be God the Father, the soul of the Godhead. Um, <clears throat> without mother, the father, the soul. Without descent, Jesus Christ. Having neither beginning of days, the father, nor end of life, the father, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually, Jesus Christ. See, you can do that when it's one being. But when you have three different persons, doesn't work. That's why all Trinitarians mess up this whole thing of who is Melchizedek. They say, oh, it's such a mysterious thing. No, it's not. Okay, you have to just believe what the King James Bible says. Leviticus chapter 26. Well, you didn't prove it. You know, let's argue about the thing. I don't have time to argue with you people. If you can't explain what's clearly before you, um, go do something else. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 through 12. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk, walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I will walk among you, and I will, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Matthew chapter 1 talks about that. Who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? My soul shall not abhor you. Talking about the Father, my soul. When he speaks, it's God speaking. Just as he spoke to Jacob, and then it, later on it says, you know, we spake with us. See? That's how the Lord decides to do this whole thing. Great is the mystery of godliness. So it just doesn't make any rational sense to me. Well, it's not supposed to. All right? You can't exactly understand it you know, perfectly. That's why you live by faith. And you say, well, I can't... I just can't accept that. Okay, then go on and live in all your pagan theories and whatever else that you come up with. Run to the Talmud or other things that help you to understand what you can't understand. And it doesn't make sense and contradicts itself. That's why you argue all the time. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The angel of God walking around. Here he is. He manifests in the flesh, takes on the body, the form of a servant. He can feel pain and everything else, and he comes down. He's got a corruptible body in terms of corruptible in the sense of he'll feel pain and he gets older and whatever else. Uh, it's not they're you know feeling the judgment of sin on it or anything although he did take our sins on him on the cross so there's that but he's walking around and it says there um therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not talking about god there are no clear scriptures saying that jesus christ is god i just gave you one can you read plain english i would hope so hebrews chapter 7 Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, 
What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these, these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, having no end of days, remember? For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling um, of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. How do you draw nigh unto God? Put your faith in Jesus Christ, because he is God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were made were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Oh, you remember old Rabbi so-and-so and Mammonides and all these other great rabbis of the past, are they still alive? Can they make intercession between God and you to make an atonement for your sin? No, they can't because they were sinners themselves. Jesus Christ ever liveth. He is the mediator between God and man because he is the flesh of God. The soul of God is the Father. That's how it works. Verse 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. Jesus Christ offered up himself as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect payment for sin and for sinners. And if you'll put your faith in him, you will go to heaven when you die. You don't have to worry about being Torah observant or 613 commandments or the Noahide laws or whatever else, Babylonian Talmud. Oh, we're going to have the third temple coming and we can start to sacrifice animals and all this other stuff. And the Mashiach will come and he will, uh, he's just going to be a regular guy and whatever. I mean, what a lame system you know, that the modern Jews believe in. It's very lame. It's very, uh, what a waste of time, quite frankly. Jesus Christ offers a much better testament. Okay? Um, so, uh, well, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. Well, then you're rejecting the Bible, the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament reveals Jesus Christ um, on several occasions. So, if you want the proof, I just gave it to you, and there's a whole lot more I could give you um, showing that Jesus Christ was there in the Old Testament as the angel of God. So, a lot of these things you aren't going to understand until you get saved. It's not going to make much sense. You'll have a lot of questions and whatever else. But you know what? God's not going to answer a lot of your questions until you come to Him and you've gotten rid of your self-righteousness. Well, I've done pretty good over the years. and I think I've you know, lived a pretty good life and uh, I'm, I'm not a bad person and God's not interested in you. God is not going to reveal Himself to a self-righteous person. One that falls for the satanic lie of Genesis book of Genesis, chapter 3, ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. God's not interested. God wants to see a broken and a contrite spirit, one that comes to him and says, Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. Jesus was God. He is God. His blood that he shed, it's not like other blood. It's not like the blood of bulls and goats and, and things like that, sheep. Um, it's perfect blood. It's God's blood. And that blood can wash my sins away. And Jesus was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
I believe that this book is the truth. And I'm going to put my faith in what the Bible says. And my family is going to hate me and my friends will turn against me and I'm going to have a problem and probably I'll lose my job and whatever else. But you know what? Jesus Christ will direct me. He will lead me into what He wants. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I pray you do that today. You say, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to wait. I'll wait to see this time of Jacob's trouble and then I can see the signs and Moses and Elijah and everything else. Okay, you can do that. But you're not guaranteed that you're going to survive it. And you're not guaranteed that you'll even make it to that time. The Bible teaches that now is the day of salvation. Get it sorted out today before it's too late. See you in the next study. Thank you for watching.